welcome to Cabaret Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roeders. Hey. Today we have a very special guest who I had the honor of meeting in person at a Turning Point event at the U of A. And so it's really cool because she is here with us today to share her testimony. She was a journalist for Arizona for 27 years, and she had a lucrative career making lots of money. So it was really crazy when she stepped down. And when she did, um, she was asking the Lord what she should do. And so many people were encouraging her to run for office. So now she is running for governor of Arizona. So without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Carrie Lake. Carrie, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to be here with you. I wish I were actually sitting there with you on your beautiful set. Yes. It's a beautiful set. That's right at your church, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, at Cabrera Valley Church. And we should try to get that one day, an in-studio podcast, because you're in Phoenix and we're in Tucson, so we can maybe plan something. One yes, of those I days. would love that. I'm actually, uh, you know, I think I'm heading down Southern Arizona later this week. Awesome. So one of these days we'll make yeah. it happen. It's good to be here today, though. Yes. Yeah. So before we get started, Dad, do you want to pray for us? Yes. Okay. Father, I just thank you so much for this day. And thank you for Carrie yes, and her uh, wanting to get in politics, as mm -hmm. she knows, because being a newswoman, that how crazy that can be. But thank you for her heart, Lord. Yes. And we just want to hear why, why you've motivated her to want to do this. And we just thank you for this. We ask that you would just guide our conversation, that we would just be, that she could just really share her story, share what she's passionate about, why she wants to be in politics. As we see, is it's kind of a lot of people say, uh, you know, like for us as a pastor to be involved in politics is not good, but we realize if we're Christians, it should affect every part of our life, Amen. and we know that politics really does affect our life more mm -hmm. than we want to believe. So we ask that she, you would just bless her to share her motivation, why, and uh, we just give you this conversation, and we pray that it would be blessed, and that people would really be built up and edified by it. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. 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 It's beautiful. Right. Thank you. So we always tell people this is a conversation. You're used to interviews, but this is more of a conversation. <laughs> like we're just getting to know you. So um, we just want to start with your just a little bit of your upbringing and where you were born and what was your yeah what was growing up like for Carrie. Um, I was born the youngest in a family of nine, so I come wow. from a very big family. And in uh, raised in Iowa on the Mississippi River town and just a really wonderful upbringing. I mean, there's always there's always strife that comes with a big family. Mm -hmm. My my mother was a nurse. My father was a school teacher and a football coach. Okay. So we didn't have a lot of material things, but we had a lot of love, a lot of fun, a lot of craziness <laughs> in a house with that many mm -hmm. kids running around. Yeah. And um, I'm just so glad that I did have the opportunity to grow up in Iowa. When my dad was 10, he moved us, um, or when, my, when I was 10, my dad moved us from the city, which is, you know, cities in Iowa aren't massive, to the country. So we moved out into the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. I like to say. Uh, the closest town was 10 minutes away. We were 10 minutes outside of, um, depending on how fast you drove, about 10 minutes outside of a little tiny town with 200 and 70 people. So we were truly out there. Our neighbors were cows and <laughs> we had farmers and we weren't farmers, but our neighbors were farmers. So I, I had a wonderful opportunity to learn more about rural life. And I'm so blessed that at the age of 10, I was able to live those kind of formative years, 10 through my teenage years in a very, very rural area. And so I kind of had the best of both worlds. Um, and I have, in my family of nine children, or my nine siblings, um, we have eight girls and one boy. Wow. So that boy, I, yeah. I, you had to be yeah. tough. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yeah. pastor's like, whoa, yeah, yeah. How, how, how'd your brother turn out? Yeah. I got three <laughs> girls at home. Well. I'm me with three girls now, so I get roughed up a little bit. It's pretty good, but. Yeah, he's the only. Boy. Yes, well, it was a gr it was a great um, you know childhood to grow up in, and as I said, we didn't have a lot, but we we learned to work hard. I will say, every one of my siblings has a uh, a work their hands to the nub hmm. kind of work ethic, and I I do too, and so I've been working since I've been babysitting since when I was seven. Wow. My oldest sister had um, uh, a baby, hmm. and. So I became an aunt when I was seven years old. And yeah. she used to let me babysit at the age of seven, if you can believe that. Well, she'd run to the grocery store or something like that. So I babysat from seven until 
I was in high school and um, I've been just working my whole life. I, I love the value of a hard day's work and I love how it makes you feel mm -hmm. to be working and sustain yourself. And so I really value personal responsibility and, um, and just the ability to go out and work and what it does for your mind, what it does mm -hmm. for uh, just your soul mm -hmm. to be out there working. I think work is actually a really good thing. And I want to see that um, more people have that opportunity. And it, it bothers me what's happening in this country right now where people are being forced out of their jobs. They want to work. They want to put food on the table, but their employer is telling them they have to get a shot mm, yep. if they want to remain on the job. And I, um, so that, that concerns me greatly for a lot of people right now. Or like, I don't know if you, what you think on this, but like I heard Rand, uh, Senator Rand Paul saying, that people are getting paid, like can make if they kind of work it in Kentucky, they can get to a family of uh, a husband and wife and two kids can make eighty up to eighty thousand dollars to not work. And he says we're paying, we're motivating people not to work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like you know the Bible says, any man has not work should not eat. I mean, unless you're handicapped, right? Yeah. You can't work. Everyone should work. You know, I said if I were ever president, I would say you work a job, even if you, it's not what you like, and then I'll subsidize maybe a little bit, but I won't pay you to stay home if you can work. You know what I mean? And it's just sad because we have a lot of, uh, I know a lot of restaurants because as a pastor, I go out to eat a lot yeah. and you can tell I like to eat. But anyways, <laughs> but, um, but uh, they say we can't get workers because yeah. they're, they're staying yep. home because it, it pays to stay home. And so what, what say you yeah. on that? I'd like to hear what you think of that. I, I, I think it's a really bad governance and policy. You shouldn't pay people to stay home and not work. And, and, you know, some people will take the government up on that because it sounds like a deal is too good to refuse, right? Yeah. But it's it's hurting people and they may not realize it. It's hurting them. You're, you're not living your, you're not going out there and living your life to its fullest yeah. when you're, when you're being paid to sit home. I think it's bad government policy. That's not where uh, the government should do. And I agree with what the Bible says, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, um, in the word and when we should all go out and work if we can. Yeah. I, I just think you're, you know, if you have the ability to work, if you have the ability to say please and thank you, and if you've got two hands that, that are capable, then you can do a, a thousands of jobs out there and you will feel so much better about yourself. Mm -hmm. The confidence that you have, the way you feel, the uh, independence that that brings you, yeah. It's really a shame that the government would try to take that, those wonderful things that work instills in us and take that away from us. And I don't think we should take the government up on that offer. Yeah. And, and approve what you're yeah. saying. You know, drug abuse is through the roof yeah. since, co you know, staying home and child abuse, mm -hmm. especially in Arizona. And so, we, you know, because like you said, when you, you know, I mean, I go, I love my family. I have four kids. We go on vacation. But after, if I yeah. spend like a 12 day vacation, like, you know, with okay. them, I'm ready to go back to work. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I love them. But, you know what I mean? So it's like, I can't Too imagine being unemployed for a year or so. Yeah. What are you saying? Right. I'm sorry. Well, so I said too much relaxation yeah. is not good. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. Sometimes yeah. you just need to kind of, you got to tear the bandaid off fast, exactly. right? Instead of just, yeah. you know, well, stay home, take this much money. If you obviously, we have big hearts in this country. And if someone is truly in need, we want to help them. And that's what's so wonderful about the church. When we yeah. when we kind of live um, the way that God has has told us to live through the Bible, it's, a, it's, it's the best self-help book in the world, exactly. right? It yeah. helps you when you, whenever you have trouble and you turn to the Bible, um, I find at least that I can find solutions for my troubles there. Mm -hmm. And I, I found I was doing that a lot during COVID. Churches were shut down mm -hmm. and I was working from home and I happened to have a Bible sitting at my desk. Mm -hmm. And whenever I had some downtime, I would just kind of flip the Bible open and see what, what God wanted me to read that day. Mm -hmm. And it, it really helped um, actually it gave me the courage to leave my job because I was really feeling heavy by what information that the corrupt media was putting out. Hmm. And COVID w was like shining a magnifying glass on it yeah. we, because we had people being told to stay home, isolate. And, and that's so bad for the, your mental health, your emotional health. Um, and we were being told by our health experts to do that. And, and you mentioned it, Pastor, all of the the, the emotional issues that came with that uh, child abuse, yeah. we saw increase. We saw spousal abuse increase. Yeah. We saw drug addiction. In, it it's just suicide. all kinds suicide of suicide other. Too. Yeah, so it caused more death in a way by pushing people yeah. into that isolated um, situation. And so I found a lot of um, personal uh, 
help in the Bible through that mm-hmm. and eventually looked at what the media was pushing, which I felt was divisive mm-hmm. and causing anger and stirring this kind of, um, of relationship between communities rather than trying to bring people together and help. And I decided that this line of work was immoral and I didn't want to be part taking part in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I made the difficult decision and it was difficult at the mm-hmm. time because there's that fear. Well, this is what I know how to do. This is my job. If I walk away from that, what can I do? What will I do? The economy is shaky. It was very shaky at the time. Mm-hmm. But I really, really felt strongly that it was what I needed to do. I remember the last kind of barrier I had to cross over was that fear of walking away from my paycheck and all of the great benefits that came along with that. And after working so many years and uh, a position that was pretty high powered. I had a nice paycheck. And I remember flipping the Bible open to um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, mm. verses 6 through 12. And and I'm not, I don't have a great memory on Bible verses. You know it, Pastor, but it basically is the verse about you bring nothing into this world and you leave and you take nothing out. Mm. Yeah. And I thought, here I was concerned about a paycheck. And and that was the Bible verse that I needed to see. I still get chills thinking about mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And so I made the decision to walk away. And it's true. I mean, we, you know, we're all worried about our future and financially want to be secure. But if we don't have a country, if we don't have rights, if we don't have freedoms, then what good is a career, a big paycheck, mm. if we don't have a country to enjoy that yeah, exactly. in? Exactly. And for those who right? like don't know how many years, so... You were a journalist, for those who don't know, and you did that. Was it with Fox 10, right? For how many years are you doing that for? Well, I covered I covered um, Arizona for 27 years. Wow. Part of it was with the NBC station here. Wow. And then the majority of it, 22 years, was with the Fox station. And, and I was so blessed to be welcomed into Arizonans' homes, really from the first day I arrived in 1994, wow. the summer of 94, hot summer it was, and Arizonans always welcomed me into their home. So when I went to Fox 10 at the time, the station was was really trying to get their footing in the market, and um, they were kind of number three, number two in ratings, and shortly after I started, we bumped up and became number one in ratings, and pretty much for 22 years, we held that top spot, which is incredible in television news to hold that. Um, My co-anchor and I really had a great relationship and had great on-air chemistry and and really connected with the people of Arizona. So it was a good career for many, many years. But I I just really felt that journalism has changed. Mm -hmm. It's less about delivering the full truth and more about half-truths and kind of twisting and turning and spinning stories. And that's just not what I got Mm -hmm. into journalism for. And I felt it had become immoral Mm-hmm. with the way COVID was being covered, not talking about treatments that were working for doctors yep. and patients yep. and this refusal to put stories out that could have actually helped people and saved lives. And I didn't want to be taking part in that. Yeah. yeah. So that was back in March, right? When you stepped down? Yeah. Well, I actually, my last day on the air was December 25th was Christmas. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. I had to work Christmas day and, and then I took a leave and then I officially handed in my resignation March 1st. So I really hadn't, haven't been on the air um, as a, a journalist since December 25th, yeah. Christmas Day. So have you always just growing up, Did you have you always been good with like communicating and talking? I mean, you have so many siblings. I'm sure that really helped. <laughs> but what got you into like journalism and all of that? Um, because obviously I look up to you because I'm just recently now getting into like the podcast world. And so like learning how to communicate and to just... Everyone who talks about you always say, like, you're so genuine and kind. And you can tell whether or not someone is, like, just being fake and just having to do their job or it's, like, they really have a passion for that. So what kind of got you into journalism and communicating with people? Um, Well, thank you for the compliments. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. I think, too, coming from Iowa where, you know, everyone's very (laughs) friendly. And um, my my default is to be friendly. I always try to be friendly first and having a big family and always lots of conversations going on. Mm -hmm. But you had to... You kind of had a jockey and fight <laughs> to get a word in. That's, and that's I, I, I used to be very shy in school. Mm. I mean, I was very painfully shy. So I don't know, somewhere along the way, I just kind of came out of that mm. and, and became a little bit more outgoing. But I, I really, um, I credit God and my family yeah. genetics for giving me a, um, a, a good heart mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And I've always wanted to connect and tell people stories. So that's kind of how I became a communicator. But you just get better with it over Mm -hmm. time. And I'm sure you even noticed as you go along and do these podcasts each week, each one you do, uh, you get one under the belt and you get another one under the belt. And pretty soon it's becoming more Mm -hmm. uh, easier to do. And you kind of notice things that you need to do better. Like maybe you need to enunciate more Mm -hmm. or have a little more energy, things like that. So there's little things you can learn. But um I kind of fell into it. I never, as a child, wanted to be a, a TV newscaster or a journalist. But uh, I'd gone, I was putting myself through college, mm-hmm. and I, I ran out of money, and I, I took a couple years off, helped take care of a, a relative of mine. And in that time, I moved to Minnesota for a year. Mm-hmm. I had an ill relative, and I lived with my sister and her husband, and her husband was a news fanatic. Mm-hmm. He watched the news morning morning until night. So I never really watched local news that much. He watched, you know, the Today Show and the locals. He knew everyone's name on TV. I thought it was really funny. (laughs) But I got to um, enjoying watching the news. And when I decided to go back to college, I talked to my college uh, advisor and I said, I kind of would like to look into doing this for a living. You know, is there a plan for me? And she helped me take the right classes. And I got internships at a radio station and a TV station. I just, you know, I just really wanted to do that. And I think sometimes we're at point A and we need to get to point B. Mm-hmm. But if we don't know what our point B is, we're just kind of meandering. Exactly. And I was meandering until I figured out what point B was. And then I was like, whoa, I'm on a one track mission and I'm going to get there. And I just worked really hard and put a lot of um, uh, blood, sweat and tears into it and worked hard and and made my way onto television, yeah. which was great. And that's yeah. awesome. Because- I worked behind the scenes initially, by the way. Oh, wow. But I remember somebody gave me advice, dress for the um, the part mm, you want. Yeah. Dress, dress for yourself. the job you want. That's good. So I dressed to be a reporter because I wanted to be a reporter, even though I was working behind the scenes. And that one day, mm. I got my break. Somebody called out sick, and they were desperate, and they sent me out. And that was all I needed was that one mm-hmm. little spark. I love that. And it's good for um, just young adults and young people to hear that, too, because Charlie was talking about that. He's like, nowadays, kids are just going to school for jobs that aren't out there. And it's so it's so sad to me because nowadays parents are saying, just go to school and like they'll take care of you. And but it's like or go to the university or something. But really, we're seeing the opposite effect with children. All they're doing is partying and not really yeah. knowing what they're doing and like switching their majors, just not being sure. So what would they be advice to parents point. and students with that? Um, just like they don't have that point B that exactly. we were talking about. Yeah. You have to know what you want to do. And I think gap years are great to mm-hmm. kind of figure things out, decide what kind of job do I want? And we, we have not done a good job with glamorizing and we should be glamorizing hard work. Amen. Yeah. Um, we, you know, our kids are on TikTok and they're on mm-hmm. social media and they're seeing like these, these lives from people, you know, and I'd hate to throw the Kardashians under yeah. the bus all the That's time, true. but right. yeah, they're living these <laughs> fabulous yeah. lives and they're doing all these amazing things. And that's not realistic. Yep. We don't glamorize, um, maybe a nurse's job mm-hmm. or a police yeah. officer's job or, uh, a farmer's job, a plumber's job, yeah. but those are the real yeah. jobs out there. And, uh, I think we need to start really, um, talking more about, like we said, the value of a hard day's work, but figuring out what you want to do and what you're kind of good at. And then once you say, I think I want to do this line of work, then you know the path to take. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like getting in the car. You just start driving somewhere. You don't know where you're going. You're just going to drive down the streets. You don't know. You got to figure out what your destination Mm -hmm. is and then you know how to get there. You can figure out all the paths. There's probably five or six paths to get to that destination. Exactly. And that's why Billy, but college is overrated. Yeah. Definitely Amen. overrated. Uh, uh, Billy Graham said a ship moving is easier to steer than one standing still. Yeah. So it's like as you're moving towards a goal, then you'll eventually get to the goal you like, you know, than just sitting at home doing yeah. nothing. I like what Charlie Kirk said last night. He said that his plumber, he's in Scottsdale, and he said, my plumber, I asked him, you know, how much do you make a year? What do you clear? And he goes, Oh, about three hundred seventy-five thousand, <laughs> and he says, you know, here he has no debt. He's, he says, "Are you happy?" He goes, "I'm fulfilled." He goes, "People look down at me, but I'm making three hundred seventy-five. I have a good life, and I have no debt, and I didn't have to go to school." Oh, and yeah. he's saying how we put that down. Yeah. But and then we have an AC guy here mm-hmm. in Tucson who was in jail, mm-hmm. and uh, he got out, learned uh, AC. Now he owns an AC business, and he makes like twelve million. I think he he, he grossed twelve million last year. So I mean. You know, and he wow. says he can give a guy, an AC guy that can start off at eighty thousand. I think I don't know, sixty or eighty thousand a year can move up 
without just doing a six month course, I think you said six months, you can make 180,000 a year. Yeah. And we put down these menial labor Easy. jobs, but I mean, that's pretty good we money, I think, them. you know. Oh, wow. I never put down, and I know you don't either, because yeah. we realize what, um, how important it is to have people who actually have skill. I mean, when you can, when you can save the day as a plumber or electrician, <laughs> we kind of wow, need that I mean, you in your really house. <laughs> and that's what he was saying so, too. He's like, I see a problem and I fix it. So he's yeah. like, I have a purpose where now I see a lot of yes. people going into journalism. I actually know, um, girls that I grew up with in like school and they are like straight up like angry, bitter women who are like believe mm -hmm. in communism, socialism, and just like these Sad. crazy activists where like you said before, right? We all knew Fox like fair and balanced, but now it's like they're just pushing their one agenda like far left. Can you explain like what that is for some people? Because I think people hear that and they don't actually believe that that's happening, but you are There's in that. There's a definite agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you have to think about what's not being covered. You know, yeah. you, oh, you see what's on the news, but what's not being covered. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the corporate news, all of it, ha is pushing an agenda. And um, they push an agenda with COVID that, that, that really refused to put anything outside that uh, the parameters that they wanted to put out, which, you know, we talk about ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. things that were actually working, natural immunity. Yeah. Uh, it really was just putting the scare stories out, wanting people to live in fear. And, and um, thankfully that the, with the with media, we have alternative media and we're getting a lot of information. I'm getting a lot of information from smaller outlets that aren't considered the corporate mainstream mm -hmm. media. And I think more and more people are getting their information that way. So we can find it. The information is out there. But we're really in a, a, a battle here with the narrative mm -hmm. of the corporate media versus the truth. And uh, those things don't align, I don't believe. And I think it's coming from the very, very top mm -hmm. yeah. of these corporations that run the media. Yeah. Karen, it's dangerous. This, this, this might be a hard question, but I really like to hear someone like you who knows a lot of people and have talked to a lot of people. What, why, you know, socialism's never worked in all the world but how <laughs> is it that we are thinking we're going to make it work and i don't understand like i'm thinking you know i don't make a lot of money i make all right living but i'm saying when people like bill gates and all these, like what's the motivation i mean I, I guess from what little i understand of socialism that the upper echelon does well right like putin's one of the richest men in the world but why would why would we want to take our country like you said, it was built on hard work, you know, the American dream. If you work hard, you can, you know, it's not like a caste system yeah. like in India where you, you're you kind of stuck in a certain level. Yeah. What, what, what do you, in your life experience, why would we want to go there when we've seen mm. it throughout history? Mm -hmm. Never yeah. works, right? And remember, I don't know if you remember, what was it? Um, Michael Moore, you know, sicko, when he said how great Cuban medicine was. And you're like, okay, and the guy from 60 Minutes said, no, that was the upper echelon you saw the health care. Mm -hmm. He says other people are like sitting in a hospital with one nurse, one doctor for 80 patients. Mm. So what what do you think, I mean, since you're getting a governor, being want to be a governor, what what is, why are we wanting to flirt with this? What, what's well, your it's take? Being, it's being pushed in our universities and our schools. They're teaching Marxism. They're yeah. teaching it. And uh, our kids are being brainwashed. And, and thankfully, I, I grew up in the uh, 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was wonderful. We we saw the dichotomy of, yeah. of the Jimmy Carter world, yeah. which was terrible. Gas lines, yeah. uh, it was terrible. The economy was in shambles. And, and then along came Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And he was delivered America kind of in an ash heap after four years of Jimmy Carter, which was, you know, demo a, a Democrat. Um, now it's even worse. What we're getting now is even worse than Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. We're getting pure socialism and, and even Marxism and communism and it's frightening this slippery slope it's not it's it's like a, a ski slope right now mm -hmm. we're going down the the tubes with this kind of mentality and this kind of thinking but it's been it's been taught to our children in school yeah. and then they go they go to they get K through 12 and they get it seeping in there with teachers and some curriculum and then it's being taught by Hollywood's pushing it mm -hmm. and then they go to university and they get more and the media is pushing it. It's, it's, it doesn't work. You're right. Yeah. But back with Ronald Reagan, he, what I loved about Ronald Reagan, he's, he took America and we were in, we were in dire straits at the time and, and through his positivity, he was so positive mm -hmm. and he was the great communicator. Remember See that was his nickname. Yeah. He was able to pull us out through that, lift us all up, remind us that we are Americans yeah. And we know what that means. We're tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're Americans clear. don't come weak. We may think we're weak sometimes, but God didn't put us here in America at this moment 
because we're weak. Mm -hmm. He put us here because we're strong. And back then, too, when Ronald Reagan came on the scene as president in 1980, he, wrote, he lifted us all up and made us believe that we still had our brightest days ahead. Yeah. And, and through his, uh, I just thought he had a beautiful personality yeah. and his beliefs and his vision. He brought the right people in to surround him. And he did. We all lifted ourselves up together. And I think we had some of our greatest years back in the 80s. Yeah. And I think still we're going to have our greatest days ahead of us. We're getting through some really rough times right now. And people are waking up to mm -hmm. what's happening in this world, waking up to the lies of socialism and the liberal lies that the Democrats have been pushing. Mm -hmm. And now it's crystal clear, right? Yeah. If you've been to California recently, you look and you go, what happened to California? Yeah. Well, that's, Seattle. that's yeah. decades of, of liberal policies yeah. that don't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can't tax and tax and tax people. Pretty soon you run out of other people's money. Yeah, like Margaret Thatcher, Thatcher said, Thatcher right? Said that. Remember that? She said the problem with the socialism and communism is that you run yeah. out of people, other people's money. You run out of people's money. And then people money. send money away because they don't... don't yeah. and, and we're running out of people's money right now, and, and the government's making it worse by telling people they're going to be fired from their jobs. So there's there's going to be less money now to tax, mm -hmm. and then paying people to stay home. Pretty soon, no one's going to be working, and we are going to be living in complete chaos, and it's going to be a, a pretty grim time if we don't stand up and say, no, we're not going to take this anymore. We are Americans. We will work. We will put food on our family's table, and you won't tell me that I can't do a job. And you won't take away my medical freedom. So I think we're getting there. I'm seeing it. I'm out and about and I'm seeing it. And I'm encouraged yeah. actually yeah. by what I'm seeing. That's the way it is. I, I've been sort of talking this message, you know, about conservative values, biblical values, of course. But again, kind of, you know, kind of a pretty bold pastor. People say I am at least. And uh, it's funny, like you said, how people like maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, I've been a past senior pastor now about 20 years. And they would say, Craig, this message too hard. But now in the last year and a half, people say, man, I love your message. Yes, so yes. it's like now it's kind of caught up that we really yes. are heading towards trouble. And uh, people are saying, that's why I like you. And I think like people like yourself that stand up for biblical values, stand up for hard work, stand up for just the American way. You know, you don't have to be a Christian to, you know, to believe in, in hard work. But to say, hey, we need to not believe in a handout. We need to work. I mean, remember, I don't know if you heard this, but people in the Depression, some people were so proud they would rather starve to death than go mm -hmm. and just get free food. I mean, we've lost that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now it's like, remember, a caravan, give us 50,000, we'll go away. I mean, what? where did we owe everyone a living? I don't I don't get that. Like you said, if someone's truly hurting, Times we want to help yeah. them, but we don't. We shouldn't pay for someone. You know, and I like, you know, the, yeah. I don't know what you, I don't know if you want to get into this, but like, well, in, in, did you see the, when I was growing up with nine kids, nine mouths to feed, oh, we man. did not yeah. have, well, there were times when we, we were, went hungry. I mean, we truly went hungry. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was difficult, but my parents were of that belief that you do not ask for anything. Mm -hmm. The government doesn't give you, provide you anything. You go out and you make it and you earn it and you, and you do it yourself. And we, there probably were times in there when I was little where we could have used a little bit, mm -hmm. but maybe and not having that pride, but I'm sure glad that I was raised that way because it would take a lot for me to ask for any, um, any handout. Mm. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not casting judgment on somebody. Some people, sometimes we are finding ourselves at a, a moment where yeah. we're really down and out and we need yeah. help. But I wish we were a little bit more towards that. No, 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 I'm not going to ask for help. I can do this on my mm. own because I think that's a great, um, you know, self resourceful um, attitude that helps you get through life and helps you get through the tough times. Yeah, I heard. And I'm heard glad that pastor. you're keeping. Oh, I'm sorry. You're tough. I'm glad that you're one of those tough pastors yeah. who's, who's <laughs> yeah. preaching the truth. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to handle the truth, but um, we need the truth right now. I, so many churches kind of went woke. Yep. Yeah. And um, that's not what people are looking for. That's not what the Bible's not woke. Amen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Guys, I, I heard one pastor say it this way, kind of about the whole thing, socialism. He says, if you want the government to provide for you schooling, housing, yep. health care, everything, yep. then that's fine. But we realize that government then will, when you when you treat the government like God, then they'll demand to be worshipped like God. Yeah. And you know, socialism, mm -hmm. usually the first thing to go is the church, church because government then is God, right? Like with Hitler and all that. It's like the church has right. to either be woke and following Hitler. Remember a lot of the Catholic priests endorsed him. A lot of churches did, not just Catholics, but a lot of churches. Mm -hmm. But we have to stay true to what the Bible says or what what is right, like like you can say, just values, you know. But uh, we, mm -hmm. I just really like that how that we, if we let government 
right? We government of the people, by the people. I mean, I think it's it's amazing to me. Like I had COVID really bad. And I was in the hospital and everyone's pushing, get the vax, get the vax. It was like I was a, I felt like I was in prison and it was so crazy. So I'm just getting pressured by everyone. Like, what's your problem? And I had blood clots like three years ago. So I was concerned that's one of the symptoms. So anyways, um, then my primary care says, get the vax. And I said, but yeah. isn't it, couldn't it cause blood clots? He said, just get it. And then all of a sudden I wow. said, I said, was I blackballed in the hospital? I felt like I was blackballed. Yeah, no I was one treated because nobody you. was helping me. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you were because we're sick and tired of people like you that won't take the vaccine. And I was like, and I'm so, I'm so Whoa. freaked out. I promise this happened just like a month ago, two, two months, months, a month and a half, three. two months ago. And I wow. said, so I was freaked out. And I said, so I was so broken that I literally said, you know what? I'm just taking the vaccine. I'm just going to do Moderna or whatever. No, um, I don't know which one, the FDA, what was that one, the Pfizer. I was going to take the vaccine. And my wife, she's really healthy. She goes, no. she goes, no, like I was taking the mark of the beast or something. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that, but she <laughs> treated me like that. But all of a sudden, I got this 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 video that was showing how they were doing Pasaki. They were interviewing, saying, so you're mandating the vaccine, but yet how are you, so are you mandating the White House staff to get the vaccine? You remember this? And they said, no. Mm -hmm. And then you go, okay, well, how many were vaccinated? None of your business. And I'm going, how is that? What kind of government says you got to do this? You have 100 employees or, or if you're wow. a government worker, but we ourselves, you know, I mean, it's kind of like good for thee, but not yeah. for me. I'm just going, is this America? Really? I mean, 1 Corinthians 11 says a really good saying is for Christians, follow my example. Paul said, as I follow the example of Christ, mm -hmm. we should leave by, lead by example and not say, like a tyrannical government, you do what I say, but I don't have to do it. I'm like, uh, anyway, so, so I'll preach there. But a I bit, do but. want to talk about that because so when you did step down from um, the job where you're getting paid very well, so mm -hmm. that was like a sacrifice for you and your mm -hmm. family. Um, you stepped down, and then you announced, I think in June, right, that you were going to be running for yeah. governor of Arizona. What was that? How did that come to be? Um, because well, it definitely wasn't part of the plan. Yeah. I mean, I, I was actually thinking, well, maybe I'll go in and um, talk into a company about maybe doing some PR work and, and talking, teaching, training people some media, uh, you know, readiness for when they are finding themselves yeah. in the media. And but then a strange thing happened. Um, you know, it's so funny. We try to control our lives. I've always been somebody who worked hard. And it's like, if I work hard, this will happen. And then I can do that. And I can have this kind of a life. And and then, I, but when I left, I said, God, I am, I don't know what you have planned for me. I I'm putting my life in your hands. Yeah. I'm truly handing it over. Yeah. Uh, and then I started of course, planning for what I was going to do, which, mm -hmm. um, was working with the company and I was going to come work with them and help them. And I put a video out to tell the viewers where, I, what was going on and why I was leaving. And I got inundated with thousands upon thousands of messages and, I started noticing that a lot of the messages, and I never even got to read all of them. There were that many coming mm -hmm. in. Many of them would say, thank you for your years covering Arizona. We always loved having you in our home. Uh, would you consider running for office, for politics? Mm -hmm. We need somebody who's honest, somebody we trust, somebody with integrity. Uh, it's so rare to find that in somebody. And we, we need, you know, a new, when the governor's race is coming up, would you consider running? So I started hearing that with quite regularity. People would bump into me and say, have you ever thought of going into politics? It'd be mm. great to have someone like you as our senator or as our governor. And I feel that when somebody tells you something and you keep hearing it from other people, sometimes it's God's way of nudging yeah. you. Yeah. And I thought maybe God is trying to tell me something. I told him I wanted him to guide me. Mm. And so I put that other uh, job I was going to take on hold and I started exploring what it would take to run for governor. And I chose governor because I feel that that's where you can have the biggest impact. Mm. We saw how powerful our governors are. And sadly, I didn't like the way our, our governor handled COVID. He shut businesses mm. down. He shut churches yeah. down. He shut our economy down, put us into quarantine for, or he did that twice. He shut us down twice. And I, and I thought that was, uh, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I thought I'm going to do it. And I, uh, I talked to some people I knew in politics and they said, not only do we think um, that you, you could run and you should run, we think you can win. Wow, and cool. I threw my hat into the ring and it only took us three weeks. People were so excited from day one. I'll never forget the response I got. I was just, I was astounded by it. Mm -hmm. I, I thought people would be happy, but I didn't expect the overwhelming response we got. And it only took us three weeks to get the signatures needed to be on the ballot, which is unheard of cool. 
in Arizona. It usually takes politicians nine months and they're struggling to get these signatures and we got it in three weeks. Wow. So that's great. Um, and we have um, more donors than any other race in Arizona, and we're it, and we're only like five six months in. And there, we you know what I love about it: eighty eight percent of our donors are first time donors. They've never made a donation to a politician or anything political before. So we're bringing people in, getting them involved, getting them off the sidelines into the game because they realize that good governance, good politicians, or good politics affect their lives, yeah. and bad politics affects their lives. And so people are getting involved yeah. at a record number. I invited some people from the Republican Party. I always invite them, uh, like Kelly Ward and those people. I always say, hey, come on over. We're having an event. We'd love to have you. And they'll go to any you know Republican politician's event. So I always invite them. And they tell me, Carrie, we know a lot of the people who um, you know, hang out in political circles, you're bringing a whole new group of people hmm. into politics. Yeah. And so it, it's very exciting. Young people are coming out in droves yeah. and getting behind us, which is amazing. I think COVID and the restrictions and, and what happened, we took away so much from our young people, from the lives that the fun they should have been out having, enjoying life at, at these young ages that they are. And, and they recognize that that was bad liberal policies. Yeah. And they are becoming conservatives at a very fast yeah. clip. And I'm I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's cool. And I just love that it's like for the people because that's what the government was supposed to be is like for the people. But now they're making it all yeah. for them to get the money and the fame and working the system. But um, I just want to ask you some questions just so that people can get to know you more and what you would do. So first, I'll start with what every if. Christian stands for. So what is your view on um, just life in the womb? Um, just for those who like, oh, what is that for you? I, um, I'm 100% pro-life and it, it, it pains me. It, it breaks my heart to think that our kids and, and a generation, maybe a generation and a half have been brainwashed into thinking that it's okay to take the life of the unborn. Yeah. I believe in protecting God's most innocent of creatures, of creations, yeah. our, our babies in the yeah. womb. Um, it's, you know, I believe in the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. thou shalt not murder. And mm -hmm. I believe that taking the life of an unborn child is murder. Mm -hmm. So I'm 100% pro-life and I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see, uh, no abortions being, you know, I don't want to see mm -hmm. any, any baby being aborted. Mm -hmm. And the left is really, they're really tricky when they play with words because yeah. they, they don't even use the word abortion because they know how horrific, horrific it is mm -hmm. to take the life of, of the unborn. Yeah. So they say pro-choice and pro-life mm -hmm. and, and we shouldn't fall into that. This is an abortion. This is an act of killing exactly. an innocent. Amen. Yeah. And, and we never should lose sight of that. So I'm a hundred percent pro-life. Yeah. yeah, I think it's. I mean, there's a little. I mean, it keeps on topic. But I think it's amazing how the left that says my body, my choice. Yeah. But now with COVID, it's not your body and not your choice. <laughs> Isn't that kind of ironical? The hypocrisy. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. The hypocrisy. Had to throw that in. Yeah. Um, and yes. then another thing is that we had a question is about our border because I think that's something we just had. Um, well, he comes to our church. Church Jeff Self, he was head of border, border patrol. You ever, Jeff Self, he was the head mm -hmm. of border patrol. He just mm -hmm. retired about a year ago, mm -hmm. but he uh, he goes here. But he was just talking about all the craziness that's happening there and everything. So, what is yeah. your view on? Well, uh, for for starters, we need to sue the federal government for not protecting mm -hmm. our border. Yeah. They, uh, we we had an amazing um, border policy in plan or in place rather when President Trump was president. And um, it was working. I've been covering Arizona for 27 years. It was the best policy we'd ever had. Like in 25, it wasn't like 25, Arizona. 30 years. I think it was something. I think Jeff Self told Truly. me I think it was the best in 25 years, yeah. the, the least yeah. coming over. And then with, with Biden, it's the worst it's been like in 40. It's the worst. And drugs are pouring across. Yeah. It's hurting our children, our communities. It's just terrible what's happening. So I believe we should put uh, more of our Arizona uh, National Guard on the border. Yeah. I think we should empower our sheriff's departments that are on the border or dealing with border issues. We, we've got $1.6 billion right now sitting in a fund that the, government has, the governor has access to and he can decide who to give it to. It's COVID relief money, but we should give some of that to these sheriff's departments dealing with the border crisis so that they can pay for overtime to have more deputies uh, available to deal with the, the crime and the people coming across and apprehend people rather than just letting them come across. 
Uh, and I think we should work with our friendly states, our friendly red states, and say, can you send some, if you have additional law enforcement, mm. if you have any additional resources, can you send them and help us out? We have an invasion at the border. Our government, our federal government is failing to protect us, and we need to protect ourselves. Mm. So we need to start with suing the federal government. But while we're doing that, we have 20 miles or so of private Arizona land, state state land, I should say, that the federal government has no say over, and we should start putting that a wall up mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. constructing the wall there and anywhere we can and uh, and just get more resources and then go after anybody we catch here illegally. I mean, if you've come across illegally because Joe Biden said, come on over, <laughs> they're not going to stay yeah. mm-hmm. and we yeah. will detain you. And if, if these uh, local police stations or sheriff's departments need help in uh, facilities to hold people, we can free up some state um, some state detention area that we can hold people, but we cannot allow what's happening to happen because here's why. It's not fair to Arizonans. Yeah. It's not fair to hardworking men and women who want a job, need a job, and now we're going to have hundreds of thousands coming across our Arizona border and to have to compete with for resources. We don't have the resources to help everyone here in our own state, let alone two plus million that have come across mm. under Joe Biden. Yeah. It's uh, it's criminal what's happening and that our own federal government is responsible for handing over the control of our border to the Mexican cartels. Mm. Yeah. These people are evil. They have smuggled drugs across our border, drugs that have killed people. They've killed people along the way. Sex trafficking. They've smuggled Sex children trafficking. and trafficked children. Yeah. And our government, our federal government is part of the problem. Mm-hmm. They're a, by, they're nodding in agreement with what's happening by allowing this to continue on. Mm. So we need to do a lot more. So, Carrie, I'm I'm going to step out in faith here, but I'm pretty sure you don't support paying illegal uh, immigrants uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's <laughs> that is such a that slap is... in the face to every hardworking yeah. American family. Hey, did you hear what? I don't know who the girl was. Um, the, it was stepping in for Pasaki. But she said, remember it was last week, did you see where where the guy asked, so why are you paying illegals 450,000 possibly? No, he said first, why aren't we paying- People um, who come over legally. Legally. (laughs) Why aren't we paying people who come over legally 400,000 or why aren't we paying the money? And she's like, why would we do that? And then he asked, he's like, well, then why are we paying illegals that money? And she's like- what? Yeah, what? Like, I don't know. I don't get. You know, but I mean, we reward, and it's like the Bible says. It says in Isaiah five uh, five five twenty. It says in the last days, evil will be called good, good yeah. will be called evil, black will be called white. Oh, white. Things will be backwards, and we you see, see that. that. I mean, it's like. So, you know, as you as a good conservative, I mean, we reward bad behavior. We're going to pay a criminal to <laughs> be a criminal. That's I awful. mean, we, we should reward what, like you said, people that work hard, people that do it the right Coming way. Because think it, I mean, I have a friend who's from El Salvador who came over here and he said he had to work hard. He knew more about the Constitution than I <laughs> did, a- right? He knew history, had to study, and then we're going to have someone come over legal and pay them $450,000, possibly, I think, right That's up to a million dollars per family. I mean, and like you said, where's the money coming from? Yeah. We're already, we're talking about bo- bo- borrowing possibly five point five and a half trillion, where we usually only yep. borrow one trillion. I mean, it's just, it's like we think money's just going to keep pouring in, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy what they're doing. It's printing money left and right, and inflation is soaring. Yeah. And uh, you're right, what's right is wrong, wrong is right. And, you know, it, it's not even Democrat, Republican. It's just common sense now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't, I can't believe that my liberal friends, and when they're really alone with their thoughts, that they believe that's a good idea. They might say that, but really, when you're alone with your thoughts, do you think that's a good idea? To me, it's it's pretty simple. Just do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I believe a good leader knows right from wrong, Mm -hmm. and has guidance. And I, you know, I I really lean on the Bible, and and I think the Ten Commandments are pretty great. Mm -hmm. That's if if you follow those, you're you're in good you're in good shape. But Somebody who knows right from wrong and then has the courage and strength to, to do the right thing. Because sometimes you're getting pressured as a politician. You know, our governor, our current governor, Doug Ducey, when COVID struck, I don't know if he really wanted to do all of the draconian measures, take all those draconian measures and shut our businesses down and mask mm-hmm. up our children and shut schools down and all of that. But he was being pressured by the leftist mayors from uh, Tucson and Phoenix mm-hmm. and Flagstaff. Yeah. 
And then he had the activists and the media pressuring him, so much pressure on him. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think he was strong enough to withstand that pressure. And he folded and he folded each and every time. And it was so disappointing. You know, my husband's a small business owner. So disappointing for him to watch that. And I know for thousands and thousands of other Mm -hmm. hardworking men and women who own businesses or work and found themselves out of a job because of his the governor's decisions. I mean, that being said, I want to give the governor uh, credit where credit is due. I like some of his tax policy, and mm-hmm. I think that I think he's done some things well. Mm-hmm. But uh, when you look at what what he did by shutting our state down, it's a really tough pill to swallow to say that he was a good governor. Yeah. Um, you know, not everyone is perfect. I'm going to be a strong governor. Yeah. I'm, I know right from wrong, and I will not be pressured. I cannot be bought. I can't be paid off. I'm going to do the right thing by the people of Arizona. It, it's kind of neat when you said that. I thought of you. I don't know if you watched it or pray if you watched it, but you wouldn't remember. But remember in uh, Gladiator, he says he asks him to be Caesar. You mm-hmm. know, at uh, Russell Crowe's character, and he says, "No, by all means, please, no." And he says, "That's why it must be you." And it's kind of neat because, like, it, it sort of similar strikes a chord with me. I didn't want to be a senior pastor, but people like you said said you like, should do this. You should do this. I was a youth pastor, and I like being with youth. But I was getting too old. <laughs> <laughs> they said you got <laughs> stop. You're getting gray. You got to move on. But but it's neat how if you know like there's career politicians. You know like Biden. You know he's never done a thing in his life yet. He's worth millions. It's like you know that's can you kind of like you said you're not going to be yeah. bought because I heard a, a one guy a psychologist saying how he ran for for I think for Congress and he just did it kind of as a joke. But he said as he when he started everything was black and white. But then he said, as he started winning and people started doing, it was he, he could feel the pull to sort of say things aren't as black and white. You know what I mean? So, but what say you? I mean, you said yeah. a little bit like you're that, not going to be bought. But how do you? I mean, because you see, Ducey sounded good a lot of times, but then all of a sudden you see he kind of cave. I mean, is it? What would you say like me? Like because I didn't do this. You're not a career. You already had a career, right? So you didn't. Need, you're not a career yeah. politician. I mean, what what kind of safeguards keeps you from? Being as we would say, and I'm no offense to you, but a sellout or kind of comp, you know, a rhino yeah, Republican. What what would you say to kind of insure people? Well, for, for starters, I, I think this is one of the reasons that people should uh, vote for me. I'm, I'm running against career politicians. If you've got 35 years of cr- political experience, you know they brag about that. Although now they realize nobody wants a career <laughs> yeah, politician, exactly. so they don't brag about it. But they've got 35 years of political favors owed on day one. So nobody wants that. People have woken up that we, if we keep, um, you know, electing career politicians, lobbyists, lawyers, the same type of people, we get the same type of results, which isn't for we the people. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I, I really, uh, I am guided by God, mm-hmm. and I think that that's important. Uh, I really think that's important, and I don't want to judge people. It's not my place to judge. But I think if you're not guided by God and you don't know good versus evil, right versus wrong, then then something else will fill that void in you. You'll be guided by something else, Mm -hmm. and it may not be something pure. And so I believe... Yeah. I'm sorry. I was going to say oh, go I was going to ask a tough question. I don't know if you want to answer this in here. But so would you would you call yourself a Christian? What would you say if someone said, "What is your faith?" Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. I am a Christian, okay. and and uh, we you know during COVID we actually switched churches, and I found a church. We found a church that we just absolutely love. It fills our soul, okay. fills our, fills our spirit, and uh, it's a wonderful Christian church, a Bible church, mm-hmm. and we just couldn't be happier. Uh, and and so needed. And I uh, you know I hope that everybody in their life is able to find God. And, and for me, finding Jesus yeah. was even a, a bigger, more important, a more important Amen. for our family. Thanks that. for sharing but, that. Yeah. And if can... we don't, if we take God out of, out of life and our, and our society, uh, and I'm not about pushing my religion on other people. Um, but like I said, you have a void. We have yeah. a need. We have yeah. a spiritual need as human beings. And if nothing is filling that, if nothing is filling that, and we don't learn about God, and I and I believe in teaching kids about the Bible, I think it's so Amen. important. If we don't have that inside of us, something else will fill mm-hmm. that emptiness, yeah. and it won't be something positive. Yeah. And so um, I'm a big believer that we've got to fill that emptiness with something positive. Amen. And I did a panel for Turning Point for um, the like a Republican convention. It wasn't the Republican, but like a national Republican mm-hmm. convention, and. Um, I just mentioned Jesus and how I believe that, you know, Jesus is Lord and all this stuff. And everyone came up to me afterwards, like, thank you for saying that. And just saying verses of the Bible, like, 
and all because all they hear nowadays is like everyone just being very careful like what to say i know but they're like thank you for being bold to say that and then charlie at the event last night that we had um at the u of a he said well i believe that jesus is lord everyone like the loudest i've ever yeah. heard was like screaming yeah. oh i love because people know at the end of the day the bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that jesus christ is lord and so i mean Amen. everyone has like right the right to believe whatever and that's what's awesome about our country but the cool thing is at the end of the day people do know like the ronald reagan he said it's in ali best Stucky's podcast room in the covers of the Bible, well, like every problem that men and women face are in the covers of the Bible. So anything we're dealing yes. with, like you said, you just open up the Bible and wisdom flows out of it and truth because that is the truth. So it's cool to see. It's so timely. It's always so timely. Exactly. And I remember during COVID, I had picked the Bible back up again and I hadn't, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I really hadn't been reading the yeah. Bible for a long time when I was a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, it just, my eyes opened to it because it, there's something there for every yeah. stage of your life, for everything we're dealing mm -hmm. with. There's something in the Bible yeah. that will help you. And, uh, there's something in those pages mm -hmm. that, and it makes me sad that we, that enough people don't know that. And, and so when they hit tough times, if they weren't raised with the knowledge and understanding and, and just to know that it's there yeah. for them, yeah. it's the gift for them. Um, when they hit tough times as an adult and they have not, they don't know where to turn. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I just have been guided by God and I'm so blessed to have Jesus in my life as well. It's just, it's, it's such a gift. It's such a huge gift. And I, I, I hope that more people can realize that gift, you know, think about it, thinking about what we're going to with cancel culture yeah. and afraid, afraid to speak up. Oh, what if my reputation, what if they lie or what if they say something bad about me because I'm speaking up mm -hmm. or I'm. Uh, you know, announcing to the world that I'm a conservative. Mm. What if I'm canceled? Mm. Think about what happened yeah. to exactly. Jesus. The persecution. Killed. You know, we don't get out of this life unscathed. Yep. There's no promise that life will be easy. Usually life isn't easy and it's not supposed to yeah. be easy. And and we'll, we won't get out of this life unscathed, but can we grow as human beings and can we help one another? And I think I think we're in a really big area where people are growing they're coming to uh, they're coming to God. They're returning to their faith, and that's one of the really beautiful things that's happening Amen. right now. It's weird how wow. we don't we don't like tough times, but that is what brings us. Amen. You quoted Reagan. We have the plaque right behind us that says, "When we forget we're in one nation under God, mm -hmm. that's when we become a nation gone under." Yep. And so we have to remember that because our liberties don't come from government. Our liberties should come, come from, from God, God first, yep. but then we have a government that institutes yep. at least at least our like people say, "Are we a Christian nation?" But I don't know if you heard of David Barton, but he's really good. He's a he's he knows the Bible very well and knows our Constitution very well. And he says how probably the best, most beautiful document, of course, is the Word of God. But he says the second is our Constitution because it was based on biblical yeah. principles. It wasn't we weren't a perfect nation, right, bib mm -hmm. biblically, but we based it. And he says when we kind of then Harvard, he was talking about how when we believed in evolution and there was no God. Then we sort of said everything is relative mm. and there's no absolute laws or absolute truth or absolute liberty from God. And we have to. So that's why I think like you're saying, we're getting back to that because we're realizing the wheels are falling off yeah. and we kind of need some absolute truths. Like you said, right and wrong. And we got to get back to some biblical, you know, some absolute because it's like I always laugh with the when the liberals will say there's no such thing as absolute truth. And I go. Well, that's an absolute truth, yeah. right? Because you just said that. there's no absolute truth. Yeah. Anyways. But do you have any closing thoughts or anything for listeners? I know we went way, um, you've been such a blessing, yeah, given us so much time, time, but anything you'd like to share? I, just, I think what I would say is, is I would try to encourage people that even though the times feel dark and like you said, what's right is wrong, wrong is right, things are yeah. upside down, we're living on planet, planet <laughs> crazy, um, I have so much hope. I'm seeing the most amazing things out on the campaign trail, people coming together. I saw a mom with a baby on her hip, one in the stroller, another little one um, who was standing by her side, and they were out at the school mm. board meeting last night. People are yeah. getting involved. They're realizing how precious, how precious what we have in America is, how precious our founding fathers yeah. were to be guided by God and write this perfect document, the uh, the U.S. Constitution. And we're re they're realizing that all of this is, is falling through our 
hands mm. that's being pulled away from us and they're stepping forward to fight. So I'm so encouraged by what I'm seeing. Americans coming together. And on some of these issues, it's not even Democrat, Republican. It's just they're coming together as Americans. I believe that patriotism is that that thing that binds us together as human beings here in this country, because we can come from a different we can have different cultures, different skin colors, uh, different religions. And coming together as Americans is such a beautiful thing. And I think it's a great, great. There are some great things happening in this country right now. I'm encouraged by it. So so I want people to, to be encouraged. Good things are happening, but we do have to step forward and not be afraid to speak out when we see something wrong and speak the truth yeah. right now. Uh, I'm so honored that you have me on your show today, and it was a pleasure to speak to both of you. And I do look forward to yes. meeting you in person. Thanks for all your time. Thank you. Thank you. And where can our listeners find you? And we'll put your resources in the link below. Thank you so much. CarrieLake.com, K-A-R-I-L-A-K-E.com. I I was just last week at Mar-a-Lago in Florida with President Trump, and I'm so honored to have his endorsement. He's endorsing our campaign. He realizes how important Arizona is. He loves Arizona. And we got to keep Arizona a conservative state. Conservative values are the values that our founding fathers had. And um, I believe that conservative values are, are the values and the ideas that get us out of the mess we're in. And I'm looking forward to leading the state through even the tough times. And we will be having some tough times ahead, but I want to lead the state through it. President Trump is fully supportive of us, and I'm so honored to have his uh, endorsement. Well, God bless you. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. Hope to do it again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you like to just listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us to check out our behind the scenes on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. You can also check out our account at Turning Point Faith Calvary. Thanks so much to our sponsor, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please make sure to check out their website in the description below. You can also support Calvary Conversations by going to the description below, clicking on support, and you guys can give a one-time gift or a monthly gift, and that would help us get more amazing guests in person for Calvary Conversations. And thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week.